So for anyone um, not familiar, uh, there is a long tradition of what we call FABs, Friday afternoon beer sessions in the St. John's and Newfoundland archaeology community. And um, last year, the NLAS took them over and we've decided to put them online virtually through Zoom while, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it goes really well. And it's just a casual chat. It's not a formal lecture or anything like that. If people who know a little bit about a subject and want to explore it and um you know usually it's done over drinks but kind of just like a chat among friends like colleagues that you would at a bar but now we're we're online and so joining us today i can't even do justice to introduce you guys because you wear so many different hats but we have Toby simpson who worked at sutton who for i think like 10 years um, which is amazing. And we have Shannon Lewis Simpson, who does many, many things, but is the new president of the NLAS, actually. So welcome, you guys. That's terrifying, but that's fine. It's so lovely to see everybody. Um, I, I think that some of our uh, friends from afar might have joined just to see what kind of an argument we get into as we do this. Because, you know, if anyone doesn't realize, we are married. And uh, to be honest, Sutton, who sort of brought us together, but that's a better love story than what's depicted in the film, put it that way. So um, anyway, you, you don't have to have your um, your videos on, but if you wish to, that's absolutely fine. And, and uh, we just have a couple of slides and we have a couple of thoughts. And if everybody has uh, any questions or anything like that, then uh, uh, Jess and Meg are going to just look and see if, if there's any questions there. and. Uh, we can answer them as best we can, but this is kind of like I said, we're having tea because it's England, you know, you have to have tea and then we'll have a pint later after the lecture, as you do, you know, so it's all good. Maybe at the hole in the wall or something like that. So it's all good. Uh, so what I'll do now is try to share my screen and then we'll, uh, we'll, you know, have a conversation, have an argument and then see what happens. So it's all good. Okay, bear with us now and we'll get this going slideshow from beginning okay this is us start from beginning come on you okay jolly good okay so this is us um first off um i hope everybody watched the film um oh, uh, you did yes, yes we, it yeah, took us three yeah. days because we were busy doing other things and i honestly i think i could have skipped the last half of the last third of the movie i didn't think it was that good but the first of it I think it was, I think it was, like, it's, it's, it was actually, it was a nice movie to watch. Like it's a complete contrast to my normal day. And I don't really see how else you would tell the story. I mean, the movie, movies are never true. And I think it's, a, I thought it was just a really nice illustration of what could have happened. And I think it was a very good presentation of kind of the methodology and the stuff that existed at the time and, and considering the threat of world war ii and the kind of amount of upheaval that people were going to be facing i think it was just very it's an interesting topic and it was just I, as as somebody who watches movies anyway i thought it was a well-made movie i really enjoyed it yeah i'm very i'm not surprised actually but there, there's been a, quite a, a a lot of interest about the film and about the site since the film was released um, which pleases me because it, it is a beautiful site. Uh, it is an important site. And uh, the book itself was not bad. Uh, we read it a couple of years ago when it came out. Um, John Preston is, it was Peggy Piggott's nephew. And uh, he wrote a article in the Daily Mail for what that's worth about her in which he, he doesn't really give her the credit that she is owed. Uh, Peggy Piggott was an amazing archeologist a uh, prolific archaeologist doing like uh, at least two publications a year for for many many years and um you know she's not uh, given the credit she's owed in that film or in the book um so that's quite unfortunate in that regard um but i, I agree with you like i mean the, the methodology that's um you know you know portrayed in the film yeah, was done I very think, well I think, I think one of the one of the things that really that i thought they did very well was the the kind of idea of the scale of the actual kind of hole in the ground because we got some photos in the present in the kind of slides later that that show how big an area it is and mm -hmm. 
And for the and, I, and speaking from personal experience, when we were there, we had sort of fifty or sixty people working there. So to open up that size of trench with just three of you, yeah, and to do it in the conditions and the sort of, I just it's just a, it's a very impressive thing, and I think the the movie showed that very well. And to be honest, I mean Basil Brown, you know, he self describes himself as an expert on Suffolk soil, but I think that was very um, he diminished himself. You know, he absolutely was a genius you know, in every sense of the world, a self-taught genius. And uh, he knew certainly about soil, but also he wrote a book about astronomy and such, yes, yeah, you know, for yeah. the common person, the common man, as he said, to understand. So he was all about trying to, you know, bring knowledge to people as opposed to, you know, people's I think, knowledge. I think it's, and, I, and I think it's very much a, a kind of evocation of the era in the sense that people didn't have the sort of the distractions that we have now and so when it when they finished work for the day or when they had spare time there wasn't the social media or the electronic stuff that we have so i think maybe people could they, they, yeah yeah they could they could you know even though you weren't a, a, a you know a university student you could you I could actually have to do that darling. yeah um there's a photo that uh was found there from uh, uh peggy piggott on site i think that they said it was one of the only ones that was found um social media sutton who national trust and the british museum and, and antiquity have been doing really yeoman's work in putting out uh, a lot of different archival uh, materials about sutton who so if anyone is interested further to go and study uh they can go and do that the other piece that's of interest and, and needs to be um and see like that as toby was saying like the scope of that the scope of that ship was just incredible it really was that's a big you know i mean we 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 had areas that were that large but we kind of did things where we brought in a big excavator to move some of the soil because it's just that's that's a huge amount of material to move for just i think we we did a, we did an exercise one summer when we calculated how many wheelbarrows of soil that we took it out of the the mound to excavation when we re-emptied it and it was like 10,000 wheelbarrows so that sounds you know if you can imagine you know 10,000 10, wheelbarrows of soil that was moved by a kind of workforce of students as opposed to a workforce of three is that's why your back is really. gone now well, right so <laughs> no but you, you gotta you gotta admire you know the tenacity of Basil Brown to actually you know, undertake such an such an effort with just a work a force of two people yeah. now he had no idea i think i think he did though i think he did know what he was going to find to be honest so, i think he i think he was he had some clue from when they opened mound two and they found they found a collection of rivers in mound two but they were not in any kind of organized distribution so he kind of realized and interpreted that as the fact that there probably had been a ship there but it was not in any kind of salvageable condition because it had been robbed, robbed in antiquity yeah. yeah so i think the the fact that you know mound one was a very very lucky escape in the sense that what had happened to the mound over time meant that whenever people tried to rob it the, the robber's shafts that were sunk into the center of the mound were not were not related to where the burial chamber was because it was an oval and not a circle well, no, there's just the, the center of it, the, the center of the mound was not, was no longer where the burial chamber was. Mm. Um, you were saying as well that John D uh, excavated. Or, or, John D you know, was there, yes. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I mean, you know, they knew things were, you know, it, it, the tumulants, the mounds were known yeah. from antiquity, you know, from, yeah. you know, from that. I, was, I thought it was quite interesting that jo with John D, like John D's kind of relationship with astronomy and then Basil Brown's relationship with astronomy, that they were, they were both quite interesting you know kind of educated people that came they didn't come through the kind of the, the system you know so that's the ship uh the infamous ship and another shot of the ship now one of the things that irritated me about the movie was that they replaced uh mercy lack and barbara wagstaff who were two of the of the women who were phot photographers at sutton who uh in in the in august with this guy who was the love interest for peggy piggott uh, he's fictional they aren't but they dumped them in favor of him, I suppose, for a better story in the novel. So I didn't like that because they deserve to be recognized and known. Uh, they were uh, women who just went around and, and uh, offered up their services basically to uh, record uh, various digs that were happening within Suffolk and Norfolk and East Anglia, um, particularly before World War II. So that was quite interesting to, uh, to m remark upon them.
And Prowl Blazers is actually a really good site that um, highlights. Somebody's not on mute. Prowl Blazers is actually an excellent site online to, uh, you know, to um, speak about um, women in archaeology and uh, in geology as well. So. Uh, oh, I apologize for that crappy picture, but those are some of the uh, the rivets that were found at uh, at Sutton Hoo with Basil Brown and that sort of thing, and that's at the uh, Sutton Hoo um, Visitor yeah, Center. Yeah, that's, that's, that kind of demonstrates the extent to which how kind of Corrodive. iron survives mm -hmm. in the soil. That's that's you know iron survives very poorly. Yeah, I mean they're solid objects, but they're not kind of recognizable really as to what they are. I think people in Newfoundland would recognize that as iron because that very much looks like mm. those kind of things that we find here too. Um, like I was saying, um, you know, the movie itself, the, the cinematography of the film was beautiful. Um, that is an, an excellent um, example of the, just the prow, the bow of the ship there, um, you know, starting to reveal itself. And I thought that was a very poignant part of the film. Um, I, this part of the film, I had to give a still shot of this the part where Basil Brown was digging in Mount Two, and uh, this was a, a fictional. He almost got buried. No, he, no, he was. He was. There's no. He he was. There, he was subject to collapses within the trench, but there's no real details as to whether he was buried or yeah. covered or to what extent they. I think. I think there was certainly one episode where it, he was like, you know, it became dangerous. Yeah. And that's when, when you look at the photos of Mount One when they excavate the ship, you can see how the the mounds were stepped, the excavation has stepped over to one side. And it's something that we didn't really encounter because when we were there, you'll see like one of the pictures later, we had a very, very large open transect excavation, mm -hmm. which, which meant that we removed all of the soil horizons as we went. So no you weren't ever really in a deep, mm. deep hole because we, we'd actually removed everything around it. This, this, uh, if you look at this image though, the first thing that, that struck me blind when I was when I was watching the film was how much this resembled um, reconstructions of burials, you know, in in the archaeological interpretation. You he's, know? he's he's in the position of one of the sand bodies that yeah. we excavated later. Yeah. So the, the way so his body is positioned. In effect, you know, the, with the hand sort of, you know, on the chest, you know, this sort of protective moment. It was a very tender part of the film. And actually, I, I got very emotional when we watched that part because it, it struck me as, you know, when you're excavating, these are bodies, you know, and, and they just had had a conversation about this, about the fact that uh, these are, you're, de you're, you're deinterring the, the deceased. And even though, like you said, most of the material or the biological remains were, were turned to sand. That's exactly what happened to him. Right. You know, as, as a character in the film, he was turned to sand. I think it's one of the, one of the things that didn't come, you know, that didn't come across in the movie is, is the fact that it focused very much on the initial discoveries in 1939 and how it's this magnificent ship burial, isolated ship burial. But then in later years, when we did excavation there, the site actually became a um, place of execution. So there's many, many burials of people who obviously were, you know, put to death Dissidents. in kind of hor horrific ways. Yeah. And, and, you know, the burials are kind of people with, you know, their heads chopped off and their limbs missing. And, you know, it's so although it's a magnificent place, there must have been a period of time in, you know, after the kind of ship burials were completed where it must have been a pretty unpleasant kind of, yeah, so traumatic any, place to be or you know there's certainly yeah. traumatic things occurred there any associations with the wolfing as you know with the royal family of the seventh century were not there you know it became well a, there's there's, a bit, there's yeah. one phase there's one phase where the the victims who have been executed were probably people who had upset the ruling family and that's that's kind of so there's two phases of executions but the later ones are certainly after all of the kind of sort of a bit i guess england had become beginning to move out of the dark ages and become you know this christian society we're not allowed to say dark ages anymore well it's dark it's mm -hmm. dark they didn't have any lights <laughs> no, that's been silly. Okay. Ignore, ignore me busy this is soft to me you know like this this part of he's quietly you know on the bank of the river there just down the down river down slope from the from the site the site is is behind him um and then you see this, uh, what, what are these called? The barge, barge the Suffolk barge, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a quintessential image of Suffolk. And um, that was really beautiful to me to see that. 
And then, of course, you see all the bling. This part of the film gave me the most anxiety I've ever had. Oh. They're hauling, they got hauling things left, yeah, right, and center. Did. I know, and that's they the point. Did. It was so chaotic. And no, so, but it was, I think in the, in the movie, it happened very quickly. Yeah. But if you look at the actual archival records, there's very good plans for photographs. So I think they, they did actually, although they did it, I would say they did it very efficiently. That's fair. Because when you look at the records that exist and the, and the publications, you realize that they did actually record very well where these things came from and what they call the kind of, yeah. I think we used to use the word tableau for burials because it's actually a, a picture of what happened and, and nobody has, there's no, even in the later kind of revisiting of all of the information from the excavation, nobody has ever really changed the layout of where things were. I think it was, it was recorded well enough for yeah. there not to be able to be any argument about that. The only thing that changed really was, um, the kind of use and where some of the things, whether they're mounted on the shield or mounted on the helmet and stuff like that. It's a rich site, you know, rich in gold, yeah. rich in monetary, rich in rich in, in, in information. You know, like this was a, a very, very, um, a, a burial of, um, of riches and, and, and great economic and social value. Um, you know, like you said, it, and it was a rescue excavation. You know, they yeah, knew. And, I, and I think the other, the other thing that's quite interesting about East Anglia as a whole is that when you start looking at this material, although Sutton Hoo is kind of unique in the sense of the ship burial and the um, and it being intact, there was there's ship burials nearby at Snape. Mm. There are many many Anglo-Saxon cemeteries in in this area of the country, and many of the burials are fashioned with high status goods. So. I think you know it was a very successful kind of part of the world if you're talking about the the recognition of people who've accumulated wealth and I guess you know you can argue whether or not that that is a a kind of a, a good picture of society but I think it's um it's certainly not uncommon to see objects similar to these that were found they were definitely the one percent there's no doubt about that I don't, I don't, I don't yeah agree. yeah I don't agree with you come on Toby they were rich. Either. Come on. This but, is uh, certain who they were, but there was, there were many. Yes, certain okay. who. Yeah. Was, yeah. Okay. So this is the iconic image of, of what one associates with Sutton Who on the left, you've got the the reconstructed helmet uh, found in the burial, and then you've got the um, the recreated uh, helmet on the on the right. The the interesting thing for me about this is is you know, not only is, is it an object beautiful and unique uh, to a large degree, there's not very many in the world. There's some from Vendel. The Vendel period, yeah, yeah in Sweden. But there are also um, new things that are being learned about these artifacts, even to this day. There's been a recent article that was just published recently that um, one of the, you know, you know how the eye sockets there have the garnets that are above the eye sockets one of them is backed with gold foil and the other is not. So when someone wears this helmet in a hall, in a darkened hall, maybe with a fire flickering or something like that, the, um, the argument was that one of the eyes would appear to be dark and one of the eyes would not. So you have to wonder then, is that evocative of Woden? Odin, the one-eyed god, yeah. you know? Well, the, Wolfing the Wolfingers family tree is it take they take it back themselves to Woden, even though Woden is you, know, you can argue about his actual connection to their family. But, I mean that was that's just, what they yeah. that's what they feel, you know, and that's where they feel they came from. So you know 70 years on, you know, 80 oh, long more longer than that now. Yeah. Many years on since the helmet was uh was put together, you know, was reconstructed, we're still learning more things about these artifacts mm -hmm. and about the burial and about the site. And it's just, you know, I that's to me is is what it's all about. Um, these are just a few um, stills of the things that were found. So like a purse, uh, you know, the sword, uh, the, the bits of the purse, um, mounts. Uh, these are, are shield or oh, shoulder no, clasps. Yeah, that's, that's what held his chain mount Almost together. like, you know, a Roman yeah. centurion's shoulder yeah. clasp, you know, to hold the cloak together and that sort of thing. Um, the top of the scepter, you have the great gold buckle. Um, there's the scepter here. So you've got four faces on either end of that scepter. And then a stag above, which was pretty cool. Um, certainly, and the, stag, the stag is one of the, one of the things which has moved around from various different artifacts. So, I think this where it is now is positioned because of some analysis they did on the the top of the scepter and the base yeah. of the stag. 
but it had it was actually located there's a there's a metal staff that it was put on for a while and then other people thought that it should be on the helmet but you know this is the actual kind of scientific location for it and i think that's that's one of the things that i was always fascinated by when i was at sun who is that we used a lot of scientific technology but we were always open to the eye the fact that whatever idea we had someone else might someone have a better could idea. Challenge, someone was, you know there was always discussion and we all we used to have like um kind of what we're doing now every week on on at the end of the at the end of the friday we everyone would be you'd have to we'd have a site tour and people would present their work for the week and there'd be all kinds of discussions because you didn't necessarily always see what else was going on but it was always very interesting to have kind of input from the other excavators as to what they thought about what I was doing or what somebody else was doing. Yeah, so I, I like that approach too. I mean, you're all learning together and nobody yeah. is, is, is an authority. It was a very, very, very open place. And it was, you know, it was, I think it was successful in the sense that we used a lot of new technology, but we kind of recognized the limitations of some of it and the successes of other parts of it. Well, that's the reason why, you know, Martin Carver made the decision fairly early on in, in the research design that he would not excavate everything and leave a portion aside yeah, unexcavated yeah. to be there for future generations when technology improved yes, and excavations yeah, yeah. improved. And I think his, his was the, of the people that applied to, to conduct the excavation, he was the only person who purposely, purposely yeah. stated that they, we were going to excavate just a kind of percentage of it because we, we he, the things that I found interesting about his research design were that he stated that a limited amount would be excavated and that he also laid out a precise timeline for when all of this stuff was going to be written up. So we, we actually, I think that's quite an interesting aspect of the project in the sense that you, you state what you're going to do and then you state like, okay, by this date, it will all be finished and the actual publication will be on the shelf for other people to look at. You know? Yeah, that's good. Um, that's a, a just a shot of the great gold buckle. The, the finds themselves are in the British Museum. Uh, Edith Pretty, um, you know, gifted the entire uh, collection, uh, the entire finds to the museum uh, to the British people, and um, you know that's that's where they belong. And there are replicas at the um, at the centre at, at Sutton Hoo itself, and some of the other finds as well. You yes. know, don't, Sutton, Sutton Hoo's been it's been very lucky in two aspects, in the sense that the first kind of great collection of finds was donated to the nation and then the site as it is now it passed from the pretty family pretty family into the hands of the Tranma family and because of the way that kind of english tax laws work when when her relatives passed away you're kind of faced with a big inheritance tax bill and as a result of that she was able to gift the actual landscape mm to the what's called the, the national nation, trust yeah. so so instead of having to come up with a huge i mean i think it was like several million pounds of taxes she donated the site to the country and it's now there open as a visitor center where you can go and That's see all this stuff yeah. Yeah. yeah but one of the things that um it's the, okay the gold is awesome and i've held mm -hmm. these in my hands and i nearly died with excitement because they're heavy and i thought i dropped one and that was bad um but it was amazing to hold these things that were made you know 1300 years ago and in some respects the mechanism you know of the the, the thing there to hold the pin to hold them together you know this was done 1300 years ago and it's precisionly crafted you know precision engineered also all of those tiny little tiny you know like glass and garnets is is precisely cut you know with with material from that period um the garnets are from sri lanka you know the bitumen you know the pitch in the ship itself was from syria there was a peacock feather cloak found in the burial chamber you know like the the, the amount the area the influence that the burial chamber and the objects within it show um it goes far beyond anything one could conceive of you know, like in, in before that thing was dug off. I think, it, I think it demonstrates a kind of an, an acknowledgement of the rest of the world and the fact that, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're very, very important as a group of people within Suffolk and East Anglia, but we also acknowledge like all of these other things from other societies, you yeah. know, and I think that's, that's, to me, that's an interesting 
kind of aspect of it all. There was a comment, there are a couple of comments I've seen that, you know, C.W. Phillips says, you know, they, it was, this is the sixth century. They had art, they had culture, they had blah, blah, blah. It was almost like exceptionalism, like, you know, uh, national exceptionalism to, to talk in, in terms of just England as being uh, good itself. It doesn't need anybody else. But then it, that's not true because the whole site is a sort of um, homage to all of the connections that are, were made between early medieval Britain and the rest of the world. So in some regards, you know, who owns Sutton Who? Who, who owns the heritage I think, of I think, it's a, I think it's a statement about the relationship of these people with the sea yeah. and the, their ability to travel long distances and, and, you know, generate these kind of items because they they obviously traveled very far and and even though their culture was maybe not adapted by other people in the world i think their their importation of stuff and their acknowledgement of of what is a beautiful object for whatever purpose they're using it for is, mm. is really interesting but then of course you have all of this wealth you collect all of this wealth from everywhere you make all of these connections and then what do you do with them you bury them so no one sees them and you don't capitalize well, no, on you them. Do, you know, but they were they were seen, and the, the statement was made. The burial was created, and, and the burial, even though the burial was in a burial chamber, is it's obvious that these people laid in state for several days, and so there was an acknowledgement of what wealth was put in the ground, and it's all, it's a reinforcement of their belief, absolutely, and, and a kind of statement about how these things are going to be continuous. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah, sword, shield warrior or, or warrior function anyway within society um i just flicked that up there because of course the one thing that everybody associates with sutton who with mound one is beowulf you know the uh, sort of first old english poem um you know metrical poem found uh you know in within and that's the first uh, page there of of the uh of the epic poem um there's one of the sand bodies that uh, toby was discussing the soil in in Suffolk yeah. is, is pretty acidic so, isn't yeah it? so this is this is kind of instead of being able to excavate a skeleton within the ground you excavate a shadow and then what we did was when these shadows existed this is actually a fiberglass kind of model so Resin. we 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 developed a technique whereby you, it's basically the same as you know if you put fiberglass on the bottom of a canoe you know you just coat these bodies with the Resin. Um, with rubber rubberized and the rubber kind of solidifies and makes a mold and then you can create these fiberglass images which um, we use in the various different display places around the site. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, it's very Yeah, it's very difficult. Okay, oh so there's, I think that's you, isn't that's it? That's me. Yes. That's you. Yeah. yeah, so that's the team. So, this, yeah, so this, is, this is kind of a typical <laughs> summer group of people and we had... Dogs. It was quite interesting, the children. components we had. We had... Um, <laughs> There's like a team of professional archaeologists who were like actually employed by the Sutton Who project. Then we had volunteers from all over the world who came and spent some time with us. A lot of them were archaeologists who were on holiday and friends of people. We had a formal field school that was open to students from around the world. So they would come for three or four weeks and actually be taught kind of how how we did our excavation and how you know what what techniques they could then take up take and use themselves when they went on other excavations so but it was i found it quite um i learned a lot there and i really enjoyed working with all these people but it was quite a unique set of circumstances so sometimes in other projects i then went on to work for other sites you kind of were a little bit of a disadvantage because we did things a little bit differently mm. in the sense that we had these large open areas and the kind of fascination at the time was everything was being done. You kind of divided all the sites up into these kind of five meter squares, which everyone was responsible for their own little square, which when people yeah. came to kind of talk about yeah. that kind of thing, they realized that you're actually much better off having a, an open area like you can see in this picture because as you do all this work, you can join everything together as you go, as opposed to trying to join it all together in an office later. That's a know. big mound, eh? That's a big excavation, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's, yeah. So mound, mound, I can't point at it. So okay. you can point, so, so mound, so the top right hand hole there. This one. So that's the mound two burial chamber and mound two had a ship over the top of the burial chamber. 
So not dug into it. No, the, boat was, the ship was above the ground. So the basically there's the yeah, crab. It's, like, it's like the one in Hedeby. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a huge, we found this, there's, there's a slot for a huge oak beam that went across the top of the burial chamber and supported the ship while it was there. Mm. I can't remember the rest because it's so long ago. That's six and seven, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the area like the show, and there's yeah. Tramner House here. So that's yeah, so uh, that's that's yeah. there's still if you if you can't just pause this. Yeah, sure. So this is the transect as it stands in 1989, but then there was a further extension of this to the east. Mm -hmm. So that's about that's probably three quarters of the excavation you can see there. Yeah, the whole site. Oh yeah, you can probably see it there. Well, there's your wee tent. Go back. Sorry. Go back to the way you were. Go back to the beginning. Sorry. Talk about that. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is um, just for everybody's interest. Uh, the, the archaeological data service um, in um, in York, uh, University of York, has uh, some of the uh, uh, photos from the different excavations um, and uh, site plans and all that kind yeah. of good stuff. So if you wanted to go and look further, you can certainly. Do yeah, that there was there. there was a huge kind of phase. The first three years of the project, there was no excavation. It was all evaluation mm -hmm. and kind of looking. That, that what existed before we can actually decide to start digging, I guess. Yeah, and I, I love this photo because it gives you a sense of the literal depth of, of what was happening on the site. I mean, that was the uh, the, the warrior burial. Yeah, warrior that, was, that was the... The rider. Mound 17 at the end of our period there, we actually, that was one of the few intact, again, it was a, the, you couldn't really see that it was a mound, but it had an intact furnished like burial. Mm -hmm. And then right next to it, of course, was a horse skeleton. Yeah. So the whole thing was just a mound yeah. over the top of these. And this, again, this is an interesting, it's an interesting little kind of anecdote in the sense that the mound, there was a mound over these two deposits. But again, they were offset from the center of the mound and in between where the, where these two planks are, yeah. there was actually another hole which we dug later that was obviously a burial, a robber trench that came down right the through the center of the mound, but luckily was in between the two deposits. So yeah, so you missed both it all. The, Yeah, both the horse <laughs> and the burial survived. So. Yeah, so that's kind of neat. There's a lot of luck. You know, there was research there, but there's quite a lot of luck sometimes too. I just love the way that, you know, the, the cradle there, that, uh, that and, oh, yeah. that, and that's an yeah. right there and, and digging. So it was kind of interesting. And, and as well, like you, you you did use an awful lot of techniques you yes. know, at the time, because yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know what year this so was. So this, this, yeah, this is um the base of the Mound 2 burial chamber. Right. And again, Mound 2 had the ship above the burial chamber. The, the burial chamber was robbed in antiquity. But throughout the excavations done by Basil Brown and done by us, there were little tiny flecks and fragments of objects, which obviously were similar in in kind of similar to the assemblage in Mal One. So this is Andy Cop, and what we did was we laid out the base of the burial chamber into ten centimeter squares, and we took spoonfuls of soil from each of those ten centimeter squares, mm. and then they were processed in a lab to produce a chemical signature of what laid on the floor of the burial chamber so when you we haven't got a picture of it but in the publication there's actually like a burial tableau of how things were laid out in mound two because there are chemical signatures which suggest the presence of a sword and the presence of buckets and bowls which were and, robbed yeah and very yeah. similar objects to what were found in mound one yeah but had obviously been removed in antiquity so although that looks like a very very blank hole there is a map of the burial deposit. It was probably just it. as rich, perhaps. Oh yes, yeah, as yeah, yeah. It's exactly was. the same as yeah. same as same objects as Man One. That health and safety gives me the heebie jeebies though. Yeah, but no I gotta say, but anyway. No, actually, actually, you can't. We developed a um. There's a chemical compound called that you, that many of the agricultural um, areas and farmers use in Suffolk because they have a, they have a huge problem with wind erosion. Oh, yeah. So they developed a chemical compound which, when you spray it on the sand, it, fixes it, it. solidifies the surface of it. So mm -hmm. all of the all of the deep trenches we worked in, you can see the this is the clean sand. Yeah, and that's and this is the sand that's been sprayed and solidified. So it gives you a little bit of protection yeah. against the size of the trench collapsing. Even still, <laughs> no, that looks deeper than it's not as deep as you. Yeah, as it looks. Yeah, and then of course there's the overview, and I love your little so tents. That's where we all lived. Like that's yeah. awesome. That and you can see this, this. This is quite an interesting picture because these lines here—they're oh, yeah. actually the during the war the 
Suffolk was very flat, and so the military were very concerned about the prospect of Germans coming and landing in with parachutists and gliders. Mm -hmm. So across the whole of the Suffolk countryside, they dug these huge ditches so that if the Germans did try and land their gliders there, it was, it, they wouldn't be able to land properly. So it's quite interesting to think that all these things were dug right across yeah. the site. And then the mounds were used for um, a tank training ground. So... So, There's lots of World War II features there too. So Basil Brown put bracken, you know, like in boughs and that sort of thing yeah. in over the ship, you know, to protect it after the excavation happened. And uh, did he fill it in after? Yeah. No, he didn't. It no. wasn't filled in completely. So they used to, they use it as a area. They used to practice mortar firing there and they park tanks in it. And right. There's all kinds of features there, which when you, when you first start digging them, they look like a burial. But they're actually like a machine gun pit that was done. Yeah, like, like these little guys, like what the heck, you yeah. know, like all of these yeah. things, right? So it's, it's a really interesting land. landscape, is it? Oh, yeah, it's boring. Okay, uh, yeah. So mounds, 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 yeah. mounds. That's, uh, that's mounds. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then there's just an overview of. Uh, you can see, it's a pretty busy spot. You know, you have your your yeah. execution burials, uh, your earlier, um, you know, the. the the Wolfinger burials, you yeah, know, and mounds yeah. and that sort of thing, and then later burials as well. Um, yeah, and then of course the later features, like Toby was describing about the about the war. So you have like a, you know, a it's landscape. A, it's a very intensely well. used landscape, and the I mean, it, you can eat, there's even kind of um, that map doesn't show the prehistoric features, but there's a huge prehistoric field system there, yeah. and a lot of the Anglo-Saxon mounds were placed on the conjunction of the previous kind of Roman and Iron Age field system. So now I don't know if this is going to be back, but this is I don't know if I'm back on to you or not, but Sutton Hoo Burial Ground of Kings. Um, if anyone wants like a, a very accessible uh, book um, that's uh, you know very accessible but not you know uh, just for anyone's uh, view, it's a really good book. I find that it's a really good overview of the entire site and all of the different uh, aspects of it, putting the whole thing in context and understanding 